Hello everyone and welcome to Christ Fellowship Online. My name is Jeannie Rodriguez and I want to thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first time, I want to invite you to pause the broadcast and fill out a connection card at cfmemory.org slash connect. This will help us connect with you and know how we can best serve you during this season. And now, a special message by Pastor Rick. Hey, how many of you have seen that movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Let me see your hands. Yeah. That is my brother Mike's all-time favorite Christmas movie. In fact, since we were little boys, Mike has watched that movie every year. And, and every year since we were, were little boys, he's always tried to get me to watch that movie. I mean, even as adults, Mike will always call me, Rick, come on, you got to watch A Wonderful Life this year. It'll get you in the Christmas spirit. It's a wonderful movie. Come on, watch it. To which I, I have always responded, nah. I say, Mike, it's an old movie. I just don't like old movies. Besides, it's not even in color. It's in black and white. I don't, I, mm, thanks, Mike, but, but no thanks. That's always been my response to him. Until about three years ago, um, I decided to watch it for this reason. It was December, and I was not in the Christmas spirit at all. And I, I have to get in the Christmas spirit to get you all in the Christmas spirit, but I wasn't. So I thought, maybe if I watch It's a Wonderful Life, maybe that'll get me in the spirit. Maybe that'll give me that wonderful Christmas spirit. So I got the movie and started watching it. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, let me give you the quick trailer version of it. To begin with, the main character in It's a Wonderful Life is a man named George Bailey, and he's portrayed by actor Jimmy Stewart. The setting is back in the early 1900s, and the place is a little town called Bedford Falls quaint little town. And of all times, it's, it's Christmas time. You know, the, the most wonderful time of the year. At any rate, I, I started watching the movie. But folks, check this out. Because about a half hour into this movie, it took a turn. And it took a turn from it's a wonderful life to it's an awful life. It took a turn from it's a wonderful life to it is, it is a tormented life. Because the main character, George Bailey, becomes a tormented man. And he begins raging at his friends. He begins yelling at his wife, yelling at his children. He ends up groveling, begging this old man for mercy. And the weight that George is carrying is so heavy that he comes to the point, the weight is so heavy, that he attempts to take his life. He jumps off of a bridge to try to kill himself. At which point, I turn the movie off. And I call my brother Mike, and I say, you've got to be kidding. You want me to watch that to get in the Christmas spirit? I said, Mike, this is not about a wonderful life. This is about an awful life. And Mike's like, no, 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 Rick, you've got to keep watching it. And I, and, and I did. But I had to tell you, at, at that point, I, I was disturbed by this movie. In fact, take a look. You'll, you'll get the idea of what I'm talking listen, about. Listen to me. Thank you. I can't think anymore, George. I can't think anymore. It hurts. Where's that money, you silly, stupid old fool? Where's that money? Do you realize what this means? It means bankruptcy and scandal and prison. Dad, how do you spell hallelujah? How should I know? What do you think I am, a dictionary? Tommy, stop that. Stop it. Janie, haven't you learned that silly tune yet? You play it over and over again. Now stop it. Stop it. Please help me, Mr. Potter. Help me, won't you please? 
Can't you see what it means to my family? I'll pay any sort of a bonus on the loan, any interest. If you still want the building and loan, I'm... George, uh, could it possibly be there's a slight discrepancy in the books? No, sir, there's nothing wrong with the books. I've just misplaced $8,000. I can't find it anywhere. Everybody heads up, because what was so disturbing to me about that movie was I realized I had already seen this movie, only I had seen it in real life. I had seen real people tormented by the same thing that was tormenting George. I had seen real families being crushed by the same burden that was crushing George. You see, the weight that was, that was tormenting George... The burden that had him raging on his friend, that had him yelling at his wife, yelling at his children, that had him pleading for mercy to this man. The burden that pushed him to the very brink of suicide. The burden was this. This was the burden. It was the burden of too much debt. It was a financial burden. Everybody say, too much debt. Everybody say, too much debt. Yeah, you see, folks, too much debt is unsustainable. And in this movie, it was too much debt, owing too much money, that Joe drove George at Christmas time to the brink of suicide. Now, let me turn a corner and bring all of that over to us. Because what an image of what can happen to people. What can happen to us? And that often happens of all times at Christmas time. And by that, I mean at Christmas time, we tend to suspend common sense and take on more debt to buy gifts for people, to take on more debt than we can afford to take on, to add the weight of more debt to our already heavy burden, we tend to suspend common sense and take on more debt and burden ourselves heavier. So my goal today is to stop the madness before it gets started. To stop it before you get started down that path. So here's my proposition to you today. Very simple. If you want to have a merry Christmas day and a happy new year, avoid going into debt this year. Transverse. If you want to have a merry Christmas day, but not have a happy new year, but have a crack, well, I won't say it, but have a, yeah, have an unhappy new year, then add more debt. Take on more debt because it'll ruin 2019, ruin 2020, maybe 2021, and years and years to come. Now, you might be wondering, but Rick, why are you talking like this? Why are you being so dramatic about it? Well, it's simple. It's because the Bible warns us about too much debt. And Jesus was overly dramatic about carrying too much debt. So with all of that in mind today, I want to unpack for you three thoughts from the Bible about too much debt. Three thoughts. How many of you have your listening guides at all of our campuses? Wave those in the air. I want to give you three thoughts. This is one you go, we like to take notes here. This is one. Please take notes on this because this is so crucial for all of us. Three thoughts about too much debt. Number one, if you're filling, filling in the blanks, number one. God gives us a proverb about debt. God gives us a proverb. Everybody say proverb. Everybody say proverb. Yeah, here's the proverb, chapter, proverb 22, 7. Here's the proverb. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is what? Is slave to the lender. Now everybody stop right there. And let me give you the big picture of the book of Proverbs, which is in your Bible. Thinking caps on. To begin with, the book of Proverbs is, is a collection of biblical 
Proverbs. Some of you are going, duh, Rick, we got that. But here's what you need to know. Here's what you need, need to know is what is a proverb? Here's what a proverb is. A proverb is a statement of general wisdom. Put another way, it is a statement of lifestyle expectations. In other words, if, if you do this in life, this is what you can expect to happen. If you do X in life, this is what you can expect to happen. For example, the Bible gives us a proverb about raising our children. Here it is, Proverbs 22. Listen to this. Train up a child in the way that he should go. In other words, if you do that in life, here's what you can expect to happen. And when he is old, he will what? Not depart from it. That's what you can expect to happen. In other words, if you train up your child in the way that that child should go, you can sort of expect the child will stay on that path. Now, there are exceptions to that. Proverbs are not an absolute truth. It is a general statement of wisdom. There are people who raise up their child, train them up, and they don't go the right way. But what he's saying is, is that generally in your life, if you train up your child in the way you should go, generally you can expect them to stay on that path. Jesus gave Peter a proverb about swords. Remember the night when in the garden Peter drew his sword out, chopped off Malchus' ear? Peter gave him a pro- Jesus gave Peter a proverb. Here it is. Matthew 26. Jesus says, Peter, put your sword back in its place. Now here comes the proverb. For all who draw the sword, all who live by the sword will what? Die by the sword. In other words, there's a general proverb, general wisdom. What you can expect, if you live your life swinging a sword all day, fighting with people with a sword, then you can probably expect that's the way you're going to die. That's a proverb. Now, with all of that in mind, God gives us a proverb about borrowing money. About borrowing money. And here's the proverb. The borrower is what? Slave to the lender. Everybody say slave. Everybody say slave. Yeah. You say meaning what? Meaning write this down as A and B. A, habitual borrowing will make you a slave to lenders. In other words, if your lifestyle is this, you're always borrowing more and more and more money. By the way, that has become the norm in our culture. That's not the exception. That's become the normal way of living. People just, oh, this is normal life. We just borrow, borrow, borrow. God says, if that's what you do, your life is you're just borrowing more and more money. God says, expect to feel like a slave to all of these lenders. You see, a slave is one who carries a heavy burden. That is a slave's lot in life. A slave has to carry heavy weights around. A slave has to carry a heavy burden on his back. God says that's a picture of you if you're carrying heavy debt. Why? Because write this down as B. Heavy indebtedness is like carrying a heavy burden. Folks, have no illusions. Listen, everybody heads up. Debt is a weight on you. It is a weight on you psychologically. It is a weight on you emotionally. And every time you take on more debt, you're adding weight that you've got to carry. Now, don't get me wrong. We can all manage a certain amount of debt. But here's what I want you to understand. We can all, I'm going to use this illustration. I've done this before, but it fits. So we'll do it again. Imagine this is my debt load. And so again, and this is debt, we can all manage a certain amount of debt. But here's what happens. The culture that we live in pushes us to take our debt to the limit 
Sometimes our own greed pushes us to take our debt to the max. So what do we end up doing? We end up spending more than we have. We end up borrowing more than we can pay back. We start leveraging what we already own. Listen, we start borrowing against our house. I just can't fathom that. We, God gives us something. We, we're paying it off. We've put it back into hock. And we take our credit cards and we max them out to the maximum load. And all the while, the load is getting heavier and heavier and you're carrying it. And it starts to pull you down. It starts to pull your wife down. It starts to pull your children down. You start arguing. You start fighting over money. You become like George, tortured, tormented by too much debt. It's just psychologically, emotionally too much, but you're carrying it. Tell you what, hold that thought. I, I will be back to that. But for now, write this down as big number two. Jesus gives us a parable about debt. God gave a proverb. Jesus gives a parable. Everybody say parable. Everybody say parable. Yeah, you know what a parable is. It's a story that illustrates a truth. So Jesus is about to give us a story. Here's the story. Here's the parable. Matthew 18. Jesus said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So here comes the story. Here comes the parable. As he, that is, as the king, began the settlement, a man who what? A man who what? Say it like you mean it. A man who owed him. How much? 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, folks, stop right there. Because what a clear definition of debt. What a clear picture of debt. Debt is when you owe somebody money. In other words, you have borrowed money from them. You've borrowed money from the lender. You've borrowed money from the bank. And now it's t- you owe it. Now it's time to start paying it back with interest. More to come on that. But again, we can manage a certain amount of debt. But Jesus moves talking to talking about too much debt. Here's what he says. Listen to verse 25. Since he, that is the man who owed the king money, since he was, everybody say it with me. Since he was not able to pay. Folks, what a definition of too much debt. Too much debt is when you owe more money than you're able to pay back. Too much debt is when you have more going out in payments than you have coming in in terms of income. To put it in the vernacular, too much debt is when your debt weight outweighs your income weight. But again, that is where the culture pushes us. That is where sometimes our own greed pushes us to keep taking on more and more debt. But here's what you need to understand. There's a high cost. There's a high cost to too much debt. In fact, write this down as A. When you take on too much debt valuables get sold. Valuables get sold. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 25. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he be what? That he be sold to repay the debt. Folks, could Jesus have been any more explicit? Could Jesus have painted any more of a graphic picture? He is saying when you take on too much debt, listen, valuable stuff gets sold out. Your values, your valuables get sold out when you take on too much debt. You say, what what, what valuables are you talking about? 
Well, let me give you one, two, three, and four. Write them down. There's one, two, three, and four. Here are four valuables that get sold out. When you take on too much debt, your freedom gets sold out. Your freedom. In other words, when you, every time you take on more debt, listen, a slice of your freedom gets sold out. And by that I mean your freedom to be generous. Your freedom to be generous to God. Some of you can't be generous to God because you're carrying too much debt to be generous to God. Your freedom to be generous to other people in need. You can't be generous to to people in need. You're carrying too much debt. Your freedom to enjoy the simple things in life. Let me go grab a bite to eat over here. To get All of that gets sold out. Secondly, when you take on too much debt, your peace of mind gets sold out. Your peace of mind gets sold out. And by that I mean when you're in real debt, when you're nostril deep into debt, you had better earn money. And you'd better bring it in consistently. And heaven forbid that you should ever get sick. Heaven forbid that there should be any disruption in your life because you're four paychecks away from losing everything. You're two paychecks away from losing everything. You're one paycheck. Listen, just my saying that makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? But that is what happens. Your mind, when you take on too much debt, becomes a habitat of fear. It becomes a habitat of worry. It becomes a habitat of panic. And the peace of mind that God wants you to enjoy gets, enjoy gets sold out. Number three, your money gets sold out. You're selling out your own money when you take on too much debt. You say, what do you mean? I mean, when you're, when you're making minimal payments on credit, you need to, be, you need to realize you're getting robbed. <laughs> you're being robbed. You're selling out your own money. In fact, a few years back, I was counseling a couple. They don't come to our church, so I can share this. I was counseling a couple about their finances. They were tens of thousands of dollars into debt. By the way, I can't do counseling anymore. Too many of you, cancer, heart attacks, but we got great counselors who can. But I was counseling this couple, and they had one credit card that was maxed out at $3,000, and I said, how do you, how do you, how do you plan to deal with that? To which the husband said, the way we're dealing with all of them, we'll make the minimal payment on it. Folks, when they left, I ran the numbers on that. Are you ready for this? Do you know how long it'll take them to pay off $3,000 at 18% making the minimal payment? Somebody take, somebody just, just yell out a few numbers. How many years? How many? Okay, I heard five, I heard 10, I heard 20, I heard 30. You ready for this? It will take them 37 years and seven months. You're selling out your own money. You're paying for that $3,000 multitudes of times over. J. Reuben Clark says this about debt. Listen to this. This is such an important statement. He says, once you're in debt... Interest becomes your companion every minute of the day and night, and it's working. It's working against you. It has no love or sympathy. It's as hard as a granite cliff, and you cannot dismiss it. George in the movie tried to dismiss it. wouldn't go away. Whenever you get in its way or fail to meet its demands, it what? Crushes you under the weight. You sell that out. You sell out your own money. Number four, it gets even worse. I'm only going to give you four because I don't want to depress you. (laughs) But you sell out your own family. Your family gets sold out. Listen to what Jesus said about this. He says, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children... And all that he had be what? Be sold to repay the debt. Folks, you think I'm being dramatic. Jesus is being dramatic. He's saying when you take on too much debt, you sell out your husband, you sell out your wife, you sell out your children. 
When you take on too much debt, you put your marriage at risk. Can I say that again? You put your marriage at risk. Why? Because the burden of carrying too much debt gets on your nerves until you start raging. When you take on too much debt, listen, husbands and wives, dollar signs start to dominate every conversation. And it kills romance and kills marriage, kills love. In other words, instead of saying, honey, I love you, let's be romantic. Let's talk about, you know how you were when you were dating? Before you had all of this on you? Let's talk about love. Let's talk about joy. You're so beautiful. You're so handsome. You don't do that. Why? Because dollar signs take over. Debt takes over, and every conversation is, how are we going to make this work? You cease to be lovers, and you become partners in money. Folks, make no mistake about it. The number one cause of divorce is money. Too much debt. So, here's the moral to the parable. Write this down as B. Debt is a cruel master. Debt is a cruel master. It is not your friend. Debt is your enemy. It is not your friend. It is not your helper. It is a cruel master. Debt is not the path to a wonderful life. Debt is the path to entrapment. And yet our culture pushes us to borrow, borrow everything. Heck, I mean, folks, we have... We have Kids taking out student loans. This is where it's gotten to. And when they come out of college, they are slaves to debt to pay back that loan. They come out in the hole. I don't know how it was in so many generations back, but I don't know anybody in my generation who borrowed money to go to college. I don't know a single soul. In fact, when I said to my mom, hey, I'm going to college, she said, going to what? College, mom. See ya. But folks, I didn't borrow a dime. I worked and paid for it as I went. And I worked two jobs sometimes and carried a full load. It can be done. You do not have to come out of college a slave to debt. Don't do it. It is entrapment. You know, I'm not sure how good my history is on this. But I think I got this right. When the New World was being founded, the Western Hemisphere, men from the New World would go over to the people in Africa and say, come with us. We're going to give you a wonderful life. Follow us. We're going to lead you to a wonderful life. I don't even have to tell you, that was not a trip to a wonderful life, that was a trip to enslavement. That was a trip into entrapment. People were entrapped. Jesus grabs that and compares that to debt. You're being entrapped. And here's how the entrapment sounds. Here's how it sounds. Go ahead and buy that and borrow the money. You can pay it back later. Here's how it sounds, folks. Hey, your class reunion's coming up. You need to show them something. Even if you don't have anything, you need to show them something. So so, so go out and buy that new dress and put it on the card. Go out and buy that very expensive purse and put it on the card. Go out and buy those high dollar shoes, put it on the card. Go out and buy that three-piece suit, put it on the card. Get the tie, put it on the card. And you'll show them. (laughs) Folks, can I give us a newsflash? Showing them is expensive. Showing them gets expensive. Hey, honey, all the, all the folks in the neighborhood have got those high-end cars. We need to get one. We don't want them to think we, you know, we, don't, we don't belong in the neighborhood, so let's just max ourselves out to the credit so people won't think we, we don't fit in. Let's see how to say this. Folks, we wouldn't worry so much about what people think about us if we realized how much they don't. They're not thinking about you. 
They're thinking about their selves. And yet we go out and put ourselves into debt to impress people. By the way, debt is not just a problem in the hood. It is not just a, project, a problem in the project. You would be amazed at how many people living in mansions are one banana slip away from losing everything. So here's what we do with debt. Are you ready? All of that. Here's what we're going to do with debt. Number one, write this down as one and two. Resolve to stay free from debt. In other words, if you're not in debt, don't go there. And you're going to be tempted to do that this Christmas. Don't go into debt for Christmas. Some of you are saying, Rick, you're a little bit late on this. I already have done it. You don't realize, Rick, it's, it's like mid, you know, first, mid to December. I've already gone to that. Can I tell you what to do? If you borrow more than you should have, here's what you should do. Take it back. Everybody say, take it back. Everybody say, take it back. Take it back. Get yourself free from that. Listen, enjoy Christmas this year, but don't ruin the new year and the years after by putting yourself under the burden of debt. Take it back back. And some of you would say, Rick, we're so far in debt. <laughs> Christmas is not the deal. We're in debt, real debt. Then here's the resolution for you. Write this down as number two. Resolve to get free from debt. Resolve to get free from debt. And by that, I mean, everybody, look, fight. Declare war on that debt. Make up an emancipation proclamation. Listen, a war had to be fought to free American slaves. And a war will have to be fought to free financial slaves. You're going to have to fight. You said, well, Rick, how do we fight? Here's how we fight. Listen, we fight together. We fight together. In fact, at the beginning of the new year, we're going to launch a series called Simplify. Simplify. And we're going to talk about simplifying our lives and getting rid of the clutter that chokes us, offloading the burdens that weigh us down. And one of those burdens is debt. And we're going to figure out together how to simplify our lives and offload the debt. We're going to get free. Everybody say free. free. Everybody say freedom. freedom. Everybody say freedom. Yeah. That's where we're headed. You're going to be here next, this the beginning of the year. If you are, say amen. Yeah. Freedom. Now again, some of you are thinking, Rick, that just sounds good. But you don't know how bad it is for us. You don't know how far under we are. And some of you are thinking, Rick, we're so discouraged by our debt that we're already talking divorce. It might be too late for us. Listen, it's not too late, and no matter where you are, God's got you covered. Because write this down as number three, and I'm going to close. The Holy Spirit is our parakletos. God gives us a proverb. Jesus gives us a parable. The Holy Spirit is your parakletos. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14. And I will pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Who is he? Even the Spirit. I love that. There is the promise of Christ to give to every believer the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And I love it. He calls him another comforter. By the way, that, that preposition, another that's a translation of the, Hebrew, of the Greek word alos. And alos is, is a word that means another of the same kind. But you know, I was thinking this week, I've heard that word alos. Alos is, is the word from which we get aloe. You know what aloe is, don't you? It's a plant that gives a serum that's comforting to the, to the skin. What an image of the Holy Spirit. In fact, write this down as A. 
The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's our comforter. When you think of the Holy Spirit, think of Alos. He's your comforter. You see, come here, Carlos. Let me comfort you, brother. This is the Holy Spirit. He's our comforter. You see, some of you, some of you here today, you would say, Rick, we're so discouraged. We're so depressed. We were fighting on the way to church today. The burden's more than we can bear. Listen, the Holy Spirit says, I'll comfort you. I'll comfort your wife. I'll comfort your husband. I'll comfort your children. You say, Rick, how do I receive that comfort of the Holy Spirit? Well, I'll tell you what, hold that thought and I'm going to come back to it. Because I want you to write this down as B. The Holy Spirit's also our heavy lifter. He's your heavy lifter. Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. That word comforter is so powerful. It is a translation of the, of the Greek word parakletos. You know what parakletos means? It means one who is called beside you to help you. Literally to help lift the load that you can't lift. Let me give you an illustration of this. When, when I was in college, I worked a part-time job. As a, as, a, as a pipe fitting welder, pipe fitting. And the pipe we fit was nuclear pipe, goes in nuclear plants. So the, the, so the circumference on the outside might be this big, but the interior might be on this big, and the walls are this thick. And I had to move that stuff around. And needless to say, folks, that was more than I could carry. That was more weight than I could, than I could possibly bear. It was tons. But in, in factory settings, welding se settings like that, factory workers refer to what is called a, a paraclete. This is a paraclete. And, and my boss would say, get the paraclete. You know what a paraclete is? It's an apparatus that uses a system of pulleys to leverage weight. So a paraclete can, can lift what I couldn't lift. My, my paraclete at my station could carry the weight that I could not carry. Folks, what an image of the Holy Spirit. He will help you carry that burden of your debt that you can't carry. He will strengthen you and give you the resolve and give you the fortitude, give your wife the fortitude to carry that debt. But have no illusions, he wants you to be free from that debt. But he'll help you carry it while you're trying to get free. He'll give you the strength so that you don't divorce. He'll give you the, the passion for freedom so that the two of you can walk through this together and carry that heavy load till you can get it off your back. You say, Rick, how do I, how do I get that, that, that comfort from the Holy Spirit? How do I get that... Helping us carry so that we're strong. How do we receive that? Well, let me give you one word. It's the word intimacy. Intimacy. Specifically, intimacy with God. A relationship with God. Listen to what Jesus said, and I'm going to close. Jesus said, come unto me. Everybody say, come unto me. Everybody say, come unto me. Those are such intimate words. You're his child. You're his son. You're his daughter. And he says, come unto me. Come to me. He says, all ye that labor and are, everybody say it with me, Heavy laden, heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, if you want strength, if you want resolve, if you want rest, it's not by crunching numbers. It begins. Now, we're going to talk about crunching numbers, but it begins by, by intimacy with him, by coming to him. You see, some of you know how to come to church, but you don't know how to come to God. Some of you, you know how to come to, to worship, but you don't know how to come to worship.
God. See, right now, some of you are doing this. When's this going to be over? And you're going to walk out of here, and you know what's going to happen? The weight's going to be right back on you. You're going to be carrying it, struggling, straining, panicked. And God says, I want to take that off of you. I want to comfort you. I want, to, I want to give you the resolve. I want to give you the strength. I want to bring your marriage back together. But it doesn't begin with exercise. It doesn't begin by crunching the numbers. God says, come to him, and he'll give you rest. He'll give you peace of mind. See, he wants to set you free. Jesus said you'll know the truth, and the truth is intimacy with him. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Everybody say freedom. Everybody say freedom. Freedom. Remember Braveheart? Freedom. Everybody say freedom. Freedom. We're going to get free this year. Amen. From debt, from sins, from temptations, we're going to get free. And we're going to simplify some things. Now, I want to take a moment and pray for all of you. I pray for you all the time, by the way. I pray for you all the time. But I want to pray specifically for those of you who are in debt. You'd say, George, that's me. <laughs> I'm George Bailey, too much. Some of you say it's killing our, our family, it's killing our marriage. It's hurting us psychologically, emotionally, even spiritually. What I want to ask us to do right now is, at all of our campuses, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Nobody looking around, because I want this to be a moment between you and God. This is not between me, you, and God. I'm going to pray for you in a moment, but this is a moment between you and God, so nobody's looking. But if you would say, God, I need help. God, we need help. This burden is more than we can bear. Lord, we need to be comforted. Lord, we need to be strengthened. Lord, we need you to do some heavy lifting. And we want to be free. If that's your prayer right now, while nobody's looking around, would you lift up your hand to God and say, God, that's me. I need help. Many hands are going up. Just keep your hands up. Nobody's looking around. No cameras are on you. This is between you and God. At every campus, raise your hand. Nobody's looking. You'd say, we need help. I need help. Help me, oh God. You can put your hands down. Let me pray for you. Father, I lift up everyone at all of our campuses, locally, globally, who are carrying heavy burdens. God, I especially pray today for those who are carrying heavy financial burdens, heavy business burdens, not just personal finances, business finances, who are sweating the money coming in. God, I pray that they would begin to get free by coming to you. Not to jump over that step and to start crunching the numbers, but to begin by talking to you, by asking you for help, by thanking you for what they already have, thanking you for what you've already given them. Lord, may we learn to want what we already have. Instead of always trying to have what we want. Teach us to be grateful. Lord, may we come to you and feel that that aloe touch, that comfort, that peace that only you can give that surpasses all understanding. God, may we come to you and feel that strength, that resolve that we will win. That we will overcome the burden that is on us. And Lord, may we get ready this new year for the series Simplify. May we be here. And may we all lean into what we're going to learn. Lord, I speak for all of us. We love you so much. And we thank you for the way that you love us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. If you want to take your next step as a believer, we want to hear about it. Let us know by filling out a connection card at cfmemmy.org connect. We want to thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.